Bang for the buck is a term that's often thrown around when it comes to PCs, PC building, and gaming PCs in particular, but what does that actually mean? Uh, to me, it means you're trying to hit the sweet spot between how much something costs and how much performance you get out of it. So this is my $900 PC build. It's my build of the month for June 2020. And in my opinion, this is the sweet spot PC to build right now. Excellent! The Dark Core RGB Pro is a premium wireless gaming mouse from Corsair with a long list of features like an 18,000 DPI low power PixArt optical sensor for maximum precision with minimal power usage, attractive 9 zone dynamic RGB backlighting, and a comfortable contoured shape with two interchangeable side grips included. Connect wirelessly via Corsair's sub 1 millisecond slipstream technology, via Bluetooth for convenience on the go, or wired via USB C. Durable arm round switches, up to 50 hours of battery life, 8 fully programmable buttons, and more, so click the sponsor link in the description for details. So today I'm going to be putting this system together. I will be walking you through the steps of the process, but this isn't going to be a full-blown tutorial. So if you're interested in that, or if you're interested in the steps to take after the system's put together when it comes to installing Windows and everything, check out my How to Build a PC playlist because that has a bunch of videos that goes over all of the steps in between. For this build, we have made a couple assumptions from the beginning. One is that uh, it's an AMD-based system, and AMD has been what I've been recommending to people for the past couple years, simply because it's got the performance that you need, it's got a great balance of price to performance and you can get CPUs with higher core counts and thread counts than what's available over on the Intel side. And whenever I set up a system like this, I always want to have an eye for forward compatibility. To that end, we're going with a B550 chipset motherboard that will allow us to have access to PCI Express 4.0, which is mainly going to be useful for really high-end NVMe SSDs, really fast transfer speeds back and forth. It's not necessarily going to help us out much with the gaming performance of this system, but again, if you're building on your own, Having that eye for forward compatibility and what you might use the system for in the future is something worth considering, and with these parts, you can get access to that future technology without breaking the bank. And with these 500 chipset series motherboards, we will be able to drop in the next gen of CPUs, which isn't even launched yet, but we're expecting in late 2020. Those are gonna be based on AMD's Zen 3 microarchitecture, and it's gonna be the AMD Ryzen 4000 series of CPUs. That said, check out my recent video on uh, the differences between B550 and B450, the previous generation that's available, because you can get those motherboards for more like $100 to $120 versus the B550 boards, where to get a decent one, you're probably gonna need to spend $150 or more. So that's why we've gone with B550. But that said, there are alternatives for quite a few parts in this build that you could swap out, such as going with a B450 motherboard and saving yourself $40 to $60, $70 versus a B550 variant. Also, I'm using the Aorus Pro because that's what's available right now, whereas in the parts list down below, I'm recommending the uh, Aorus Elite or the Gaming X, which should be $30 to $40 less expensive than this motherboard. That said, you should go with the motherboard that meets your needs, that has the features you want that aesthetically uh, appeals to your tastes and that you can find available in stock for a reasonable price. But now I'm going to go over these parts and where there are viable alternatives, I will point them out. So let's start by talking about the CPU. The CPU we're using for this build is the Ryzen 5 3600, and this one you can find for about $170 right now. It originally sold for $200, prices have come down a bit. It comes with the processor itself and a cooler inside, which is the Wraith Stealth, which is a lower profile cooler, which will get the job done, but it's not the best. So this is gonna be the most budget-friendly option when it comes to price, and again, will give you a perfectly functional processor. That said, you do have some other options. You could get the 3600 and upgrade the cooler to something like a Hyper 212 Black Edition. An air cooler in the $30 to $50 range uh, will get you some additional performance out of the processor, will help it run cooler, and should also run a little bit quieter, and that will vary, of course, depending on the cooler that you actually choose, but the Hyper 212 is a, is a good one. It's been around for quite some time, and a Black Edition, actually, it looks nice too. Here is the Wraith Stealth that's going to ship with the 3600. This is the Wraith Spire. You can just see it's larger. It's got a much uh, taller stack of aluminum fins there, so it's going to do a better job at pulling the heat up off of the CPU and dissipating it. Again, both of these coolers are fine, adequate, functional, and will work for you. So if you are on a budget, that's probably what you're going to go with. And since we're building with the 3600 today, that's what I'm going to go with, just this Wraith Stealth. The 3600X is going to be your slight upgrade from the 3600. This is still a 6-core, 12-thread processor, so functionally speaking, you're going to get roughly the same performance out of either of these. The 3600X is going to run at a higher frequency on a few of its cores, and the dies they use in these are binned. That means they that AMD tests them beforehand to see what frequency they're able to achieve. So even if you're taking 
taking overclocking and an aftermarket cooler into consideration. If you add an aftermarket cooler and overclock the 3600 and then do the same with the 3600X, the 3600X should still outperform it by maybe one or 200 megahertz. And that's just a benefit of these chips being binned a little bit better. They're actually able to maintain higher clock speeds. That said, the 3600X is gonna cost you around 200 bucks. So it's gonna be a good 20 to 30, maybe $40 more expensive than the 3600. So if you're sticking to a budget, this is totally fine and is the way to go. Our motherboard today is the B550 Aorus Pro. And uh, this is a gigabyte motherboard and it's already gone through some initial tests from some uh, reputable tests testers out there, Hardware Unbox did a bit of testing on it. It uh, does really well when it comes to cooling for the power delivery and it's got a good power delivery setup as well. That said, if you want to save some money and if PCI Express 4.0 isn't your cup of tea or you know you don't need it, going with a B450 motherboard can save you maybe 40, 60, 70 dollars depending on which uh, B550 variant you're comparing it to. That said, these B450 motherboards are getting harder and harder to come by, especially if you're trying to buy them at their retail price. So if you want the B450 Tomahawk or Tomahawk Mac, I would not spend more than $110 to $120 on them. If you're seeing overpriced versions of these, then it's gonna be well worth your while to just go ahead and upgrade to one of these newer B550 options. Again though, this is a, about a $180 MSRP motherboard from Gigabyte, and what I'm recommending is something more in the $140 to $160 range if you can find it. Unfortunately, with the B550 launch, a lot of those sort of lower or mid-tier boards didn't seem to be available right out of the gate, so, so sometimes you just gotta go with what you have or what you can get your hands on, um, but bear in mind that when I talk about the overall cost of this build, I am referring to that less expensive B550 Aorus Elite or the Gaming X. Other than your CPU, the graphics card is gonna have the biggest impact on performance and the, definitely the biggest impact on gaming performance. We're aiming for around a $300 graphics card and for that you can get the uh, EVGA RTX 2060 KO. These sell for around $300 for the standard version and about $310 to $320 for the ultra version, which is the same, just comes with a slight manufacturer overclock. This is what we're building with today. Bear in mind, if you're looking at RTX 2060s, there are a lot of them that cost $350 to $400. Don't buy those. The KO is a great bang for the buck at around $300. Bucks. And again, don't pay too much more than $300 or $320 for the KO either. One really nice feature about these RTX cards from NVIDIA is they have the newer NVNC encoder. So if you're going to be gaming and streaming or gaming and capturing your gameplay to edit and re-upload or something like that, you can do the video encoding on the GPU that takes a lot of the load off of the CPU and these newest RTX cards do a really, really good job at it and has minimal impact on your gaming performance as well. That said, with a six core and 12 thread processor with the 3600 or 3600X, you do have some CPU overhead. You've probably got a little bit of room to do encoding on the CPU rather than the GPU. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility. And if you are interested or you can find a good deal on one of these AMD Radeon cards, that's worth looking into as well. The Radeon RX 5700 and 7700 XT occasionally go on sale for the mid to low $300 range, and that's definitely worth your while. These will outperform the RTX 2060 in most games when it comes to a strict uh, FPS comparison. And then there's also the 5600 XT, which can often be found for $300 or even a little bit less than that. This is another great competitor for the RTX 2060 and can outperform it depending on the game that you're playing and the resolution that you're testing at. That said though, these Radeon GPUs don't have as good of a built-in encoder as the RTX 2060. So maybe that's a significant decision-making factor for you. Maybe it is not, but uh, definitely check pricing for 5600 XTs and 5700s before you go ahead and drop your cash on the RTX 2060. So I'm trying to go down these based on the impact on your overall system performance. And of course, CPU and GPU are very important for that. Uh, the other parts we have remaining are case, power supply, storage, and memory. The memory is gonna be the other thing that has a fairly significant impact. And in particular with these Ryzen CPUs, the speed that your memory is running at will impact the speed that the Infinity fabric of the Ryzen CPU operates at, which is basically the internal parts of the CPU talk to each other. They're gonna to talk to each other at a faster speed if you run faster memory. So DD DDR4 3600 is the speed that is recommended. So I have linked in the description this Ripjaws 5 kit, which is DDR4 3600. It is a 16 gig kit, and I have already tested it with several different motherboards. You can install it, and then you can just go into the motherboard and enable the XMP settings. That will set your memory to run at the proper speed. That will get you the performance you want out of your system. And yes, there is other memory out there available. This is by no means the only possible solution for this. If you've chosen your motherboard, go to the motherboard manufacturer's website and check their QVL, 
qualified vendor list. They will have memory that they've tested. Look for 3600 speed memory that's been tested to work with the motherboard you've chosen and then buy that memory instead. Also note that there is no RGB lighting on this memory because that, that would cost extra money and doesn't make things faster despite popular opinion on the PC Master Race subreddit. For storage, if we're looking for bang for the buck, you want a 500 gig class SATA SSD, one of these little 2.5 inch jobs. You can get M.2 NVMe SSDs that are gonna be a little bit faster. They will also cost a little bit more money. That's not gonna affect your gaming performance. Might affect how quickly your game loads up, but once you're in the game, uh, the SSD is not gonna have any impact on your actual game performance. This is a Samsung 850 Pro, which is a good one. I've got some ADATA models listed down in the description, uh, so check that out. And again, 500 gig SSD, there's a lot of them available. Lastly, we have case and power supply. The case we're using today is the NZXT H510, a mid tower case. These generally go for about $70. And in my opinion, this is just sort of your consummate example of the bang for the buck case. You don't need to spend much more than $70 for an adequate ATX case. It has two fans included. It has a tempered glass side panel window. It has a power supply basement at the bottom. It's easy to build in. So if you have a case that you like better than this one, because case is gonna be the most significant thing aesthetically when it comes to just looking at your system after it's built, by all means, go ahead you can swap out pretty much any standard ATX case for the H510 with this build all I'm trying to say though is that for 70 bucks this is what you get and it's all you really need so I wouldn't recommend spending too much more than this lastly we have a power supply and I've been guilty of doing this in the past because for some reason power supplies are hard to come by right now but I'm using a different power supply than the one that's recommended down in the video's description uh, I'm recommending a 650 watt C sonic unit down there which is 80 plus bronze rated this is a 750 watt unit Unit, that's 80 plus gold rated. This is going to cost you more money. For the 650 bronze units, you can generally find those for about 60 to 80 dollars right now, depending on whether they have a mail and rebate or something like that. This one has the benefit of being fully modular, so all of these cables can be removed and uh, you only need to plug in the ones that you want. I also have a sleeved cable kit for this, so aesthetically, this is going to make things look a little bit nicer. All that said, though, you don't need all of this. Uh, the 650 80 plus bronze non modular unit linked in the description will power your system in the exact same way that this one will and it'll probably cost you a good 40 to 50 dollars less so those are my parts as well as viable alternatives where i think necessary viable alternatives are viable i'm going to now assemble this system you guys can watch let's go So with any build I'm doing, I usually like to pull the case out and uh, take a look at it and just you know, make sure everything's where it should be. H510 just has a captured thumb screw in the back and then a couple nubs that pop in along the top so you can sort of pull that out. Then you can remove this entire tempered glass side panel piece. Uh, I usually recommend leaving the plastic and stuff on this just to keep it safe and protected from fingerprints and stuff until the build is finished. Here will guard it for us, I'm sure. So this case, uh, the main intake is actually along this side right here, and this does have a, a bit of dust filtration if you remove this other side panel. It has a USB Type-C port on top, which is cool as well. You've got some radiator support up in front if you ever did decide to go with like an all-in-one liquid cooler, something like that. That's an upgrade that is, is totally possible. And then I like the fact that it comes with a couple fans, which is gonna be adequate for airflow for getting up and running. You can add more fans if you want, of course, and that will increase your airflow and possibly keep things running a little bit cooler. You can add two more to the front here, 120 or 140 millimeter options. Uh, the two that it comes with are 120s. Other things to point out are this power supply sort of cage basement area down at the bottom. That means that if you get a power supply that does not have modular cables, there's a space to tuck them away down there where it won't be uh, visibly showing. This vertical bar here uh, can be an accent color with some of the other variants of this case. Uh, so that's nice and it kind of covers the pass through area for some of your cables there. So as you're bringing them out, uh, that keeps it looking a little bit cleaner as well. There's a big cutout here for a back plate for your CPU cooler and that can actually be really helpful if you're upgrading your cooler in the future. That means you can access the back of the motherboard to remove screws if you need to rather than removing the entire motherboard from the case which is much more of a pain in the butt. Here's the other side panel with that dust filter and then just look at the rear panel where you can see a couple 2.5 inch SSD mounts and then that basement area down in the bottom. Towards the front of that there's also a couple drive cages for 3.5 inch drives if you add those in. And I want to point out really quickly I always forget to mention this but uh, I'm recommending a 500 gig SSD uh, to get this system up and running and that's where you would install your main operating system which is probably going to be Windows 10 if you're building a gaming PC, but you're probably going to want more storage than that because those drives can fill up quickly. I often recommend if you have an old system that has maybe a one or two terabyte hard drive in it, you can pull a 3.5 inch mechanical drive out of that, 
reformat it, and then drop it in here to give yourself some more storage. I'm gonna start putting this together now. Uh, I have set the motherboard on top of the retail box, a cardboard box, just to protect it a little bit. We're gonna install the CPU and the memory so the motherboard can be set up and then install that all in the case. Once the CPU is installed, we'll also do the cooler. The cooler has thermal paste pre-applied on the bottom, so we're gonna try not to touch that, and we're just gonna use that. This cooler also mounts via these four screw-down points to a bracket that's actually on the back side of the motherboard. You can see right there. So we're gonna need to remove these two brackets on either side and we'll keep those and that will allow us to mount the cooler, but CPU first. So because the front panel in this case actually doesn't come off, uh, they have a bracket right here for what you, I think what NZXT wants you to do is get an NZXT all-in-one liquid cooler and then you can mount the radiator right there and isn't that convenient. But um, since we're not doing that with this build, I've taken the top fan, I've moved it to the front, positioned it as an intake, uh, the back of the fan right there so the air is gonna be blowing this direction. This is gonna provide us a little bit more balanced airflow for the system by having a sort of lower down intake up front and an upper exhaust in the back. And if I wanted to increase the airflow in the system, I'd probably just get two more fans and do one more in the front and one more in the top from the position where I removed this one. I'm gonna install the motherboard in the case now, and uh, one of the reasons I like this case is it's set up pretty well, especially for new users. Uh, you're gonna have standoffs. These are required uh, to put a little bit of separation between this big steel panel that's uh, side of the case and the actual mounting points on the motherboard itself, like this one up here in the corner. These are grounded, so when you mount it here, it's gonna ground the motherboard to the case, but these are the only places you want it grounded, so it's worth your while to double check and make sure that the nine mounting points typical for a standard ATX motherboard each have a standoff inside the case. This NZXD H510 is already set up with the nine mounting points for a regular motherboard. And the center one here has a little post that sticks up rather than an actual screw hole in it, uh, which is gonna hold the motherboard in place when we install it. The other thing that you would typically concern yourself with in this step is a motherboard IO shield, which you would install to this IO uh, knockout back here at the back. But a lot of these newer motherboards have the IO shields pre-installed. It's a fixed IO shield, uh, which is a feature that I really like. It means you can't accidentally forget the IO shield, but some worth pointing out, especially if you got a different motherboard that didn't have that integrated. So the motherboard's now sitting, resting comfortably on the uh, mounting points held in place by that center post. Now I'm just gonna mount it with the rest of the screws. The screws are included with the little accessory box with the case. And another thing I like about this case is they've taken just the small step, but very handy, of actually bagging these little screws individually. It makes it a little bit easier to figure out which ones you need. Speaking of baggies of screws, uh, bear in mind you have two different thread types with the screws. There's UNC632 and there is M3. The ones you want for the motherboard installation are the UNC632 ones. And if you're not sure, pull out one of the standoffs either from the case or from the accessory bag and then just do a little test and see which one is threaded right. And when mounting the motherboard, the rule of thumb is the screws should be snug, but not too tight. So at this point, I'm gonna to try to connect a lot of the stuff from the case up to the motherboard. These are all the plugs and various things in the back that uh, need to, to be plugged in. So these are a couple plugs coming over from the two fans. These are just little three pin fan plugs that need to plug into fan headers on the motherboard. For those USB front panel connections that I showed you guys, there's two plugs. This is a USB 3.0 plug for the full size type A port. And then this one is the newer USB 3.2 Gen 2 front panel header. Unfortunately, our motherboard does not have this header, so we're not gonna be able to make use of that port. This is a feature that I really like on cases, especially if you're gonna do uh, high-speed transfers, but definitely something to consider if you're choosing a motherboard. If you wanna have access to that connector and that front panel USB Type-C 3.2 Gen 2 port, you would want to get a motherboard that has that port available. I was actually kind of disappointed that this Aorus Master does not have that. Finally, you have these two blocks, which look very similar, but note that they are keyed somewhat differently and uh, they should not be plugged into the wrong port. HD audio is for the mic and headphone jack on the front, and that will plug into the HD audio header at the bottom of the motherboard. And then another thing I like about 
this case is the front panel is uh, all in one block. And this should be compatible with a really wide variety of motherboards on the market. They're all pretty much using this layout when it comes to the front panel connections for power, reset, and LED buttons. If for some reason your motherboard has a different layout of the front panel header connector pins, they provide you with this little extension. You just plug that in like that, and then that will give you these uh, generally hated little individual front panel connectors, again, for hard drive, LED, power switch, and power LED. Here's another little feature that I like about this case. Uh, it has these little 2.5 inch trays for the SSDs. Uh, they're plastic trays, but they get the job done. Two of them are mounted back behind the motherboard tray, but you can actually remove them. And then this uh, grid of uh, hole punches here above the power supply area, basically anywhere along here, you can just position the SSD where you want it and it will kind of snap into place. And that means if you have an SSD that you're proud of or that matches with your color scheme or whatever, you can proudly display it right here where it will be visible. Or if you have an SSD that's ugly or you're ashamed of for some reason, you can hide it back behind the motherboard tray. I decided with this build, I wanted to get everything plugged in where possible without the power supply installed because that's gonna add a bunch of extra cables for power. So for the SSD, there's just a single data cable here uh, that connects to the motherboard over here. And then we'll need the longer uh, flat power connector there from the power supply as well. For SATA SSDs, these plugs are L-shaped, so it's very difficult to plug them in the wrong way. Just bear in mind which way the L-shape is going so you can plug it in properly. Popping in the power supply next. Uh, another nice thing about this case, I know I mentioned this multiple times, but this is the reason why I'm saying $70 case, it has all these features, which are kind of the features that you want and you don't really need to pay too much more than that. This is a dust filter that fits just below the power supply. So as the power supply is sucking in air to keep itself cool, dust is gonna collect there over time and you can clean that filter out uh, when necessary. The power supply itself just mounts from the back here. We're going to line it up with the power supply mounting area here. Once again, a separate baggie of screws. These are 632 threaded, but they have hex heads. And with four of these, our power supply is now secure. Bear in mind, there's an on off switch here. When we do our test boot, we wanna switch that into the on position. Also plugging in the AC power cable would be helpful. Now we have uh, all of our extra cables and if you have pre-plugged in your cables, they'll be all right here. Or if you have a non-modular power supply, you'll have a lot of cables right here. You wanna separate out the ones that you need to plug into the motherboard and then tuck the rest away as best you can. So for your motherboard, you're gonna have one main 24 pin connector and bear in mind all these connectors have a latch or a catch on one side, so they only plug in one way. Uh, for your motherboard as well, you're gonna have supplemental CPU power. And depending on the motherboard, you might have a four pin, an eight pin, or an eight pin plus the four pin, or sometimes even two eight pins. Depending on the wattage of your power supply, you might have fewer or more of these, uh, but you can separate them out into the four pin blocks. You just need to squeeze that little catch there with some tweezers. Finally, our graphics card has supplemental power as well with this eight pin block right here. Not all graphics cards require extra power. Some lower end ones can just uh, operate off of the power it gets via the PCIe bus, but most mid range and higher end ones will have at least an extra six pin or an eight pin. Keep in mind the eight pin block of plugs for a graphics card is labeled VGA and is different than the one for the CPU. For the graphics card, you might have a six pin or you might have an eight pin that adds two more along the side. And again, the CPU is gonna be separated into two blocks of four or just a single block of eight. And again, will usually be labeled CPU. It's really hard to accidentally plug these into the wrong one, but it can be done. And it's definitely something you want to avoid because you'll probably damage your hardware. So again, guys, I'm not doing a step-by-step -step tutorial here, so check those out if you want a little bit more of a walkthrough of this, but I just wanted to point out that I've plugged things in. So supplemental CPU power up here, as well as a fan header plugged in next to it. This is the 24 pin main power connector, and there's the other fan header for the front fan plugged in just below that. Right here is the SATA data cable, and that's routed back through there and then coming out here to plug into the SSD. Front panel header is right here, and again, just so nice to plug that in with a single block rather than those individual plugs. There's the USB 3.0 and then the HD audio for the front panel mic and headphone jacks over there on the bottom left. And then from the basement down there, I fed up uh, the eight pin here, the six plus two pin for the graphics card, which we will be installing next.
And just like that, the build is all assembled. I think everything came together quite well, and that's part of the reason I chose some parts that I've worked with before, because I wanted to recommend something to you guys that you could assemble without too much difficulty, especially if you're building for the first time. Now I have plugged in the AC power cord. I'm going to flip the switch on. I have not put the tempered glass side panel back on yet because it is common PC building superstition that that is bad luck to do before you've powered on for the first time. I gotta be honest, I think that's the first time I've forgotten that. The other end of the power cable. <laughs> Let's give that one more shot. Hey, fans are spinning up. We got some LEDs going on. And at this point, uh, assuming that everything's functional for you and there's no smoke or flames or anything, which isn't common, by the way, don't, don't get too over concerned about that. But now you would wanna move on to the next steps, which would include installing probably Windows 10 if you're building a gaming PC, getting all the software and drivers set up, maybe jumping into the UEFI BIOS for the motherboard to make sure that everything is being recognized properly, maybe plug in the XMP settings for your memory, but all of that is covered in my tutorial video on how to set up a new computer that you've just built. So I'll link that in the description along with some more tutorials uh, that are a little bit more step-by-step -step than the video I've made today. And I'd love to hear feedback from you guys as well. If any of you have built this specific system or a system akin to it, swapping out some parts here and there, send me a tweet at Paul Hardware uh, on Twitter and, and send me a picture and I'll let you guys know what I think. Uh, and of course, comments down in the comment section are always welcome, as well as hitting that thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more videos like this one. And don't forget to check out my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses with my super awesome thumbscrew logo emblazoned upon them. They're all really nice and soft and like literally this is the only shirts I, I usually wear and I wouldn't wear the shirts unless they were high quality. I think that's enough for this one though you guys. Uh, links to all these parts that I used today are down in the video's description. We'll see you guys in the next one. <laughs>